prairie. Plan, yeah. Planet of the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, easy. And we're over. Oh. It's all kicking off. <laughs> Andy Kearns, how the hell are you? Really good, mate. Thanks. Good to see you, Evan. Yeah, always good to see you, mate. Um, you've just been uh, out there in Stone Dead doing the signing session. Yeah. You haven't played yet, but how's it feel to be here today? Absolutely brilliant so far. People are lovely. Uh, love the, the, the venue. Signing session was great. We met people there from Finland. We met people from Ireland. We met people from Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really good crowd. Love the setup. Everything's been very well looked after, and of course, there's a good Irish contingent backstage. You've had another great year. Uh, Hard Cold Fire was released 2023. Brilliant response to it. Loved all the colour vinyls you oh, put yeah. out. How was it for you doing that album and now the response and that it's been out? Well, the, the album was good because we'd have written during lockdown and we'd, we wanted to write an album that wasn't a lockdown Woe Is Me album. People are so sick can, of it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah they are. That's, what we, that's exactly what we said. We said, look, people have had enough, they've suffered enough. So we chose like all the energy up tempo songs. Okay. Um, it was the first record in 20 odd years to go into the charts, which we were absolutely stunned at, and uh, countries in Europe as well. You worked with Chris Sheldon again, yeah, yeah. who obviously yes, was behind yeah. the knobs and yeah. that album. I mean, and he worked with you recently as well, didn't he? He did cleave the album before yeah, this one, yeah, yeah. he did, yeah. You obviously have a working relationship stretching way back. Has anything changed since those days? or? Uh, well, no, his, his technical, he's obviously very old okay with modern recording technology, he gets up to speed with that. The thing about Chris is, um, he's the kind of person that could, you would not see him for two years, and when you see him, it's like you're just carrying on the conversation from where yeah. he left off. He was such a big part of the therapy story in the early 90s. And whenever he did Cleave on Marshall Records in 2018, he actually came out of retirement because he was just a mixer now. Right, yeah. He's he's married, you know, he's got children and he lives in North London. He's got his own studio, and the whole stress of recording um, wasn't really for him. But he loved mixing, yeah. and he did a lot. He worked on Rocket Man, the movie, and things yeah, like that. Yeah. He was doing that. But then we asked him to produce the record when we met him one day, and he said, oh, I don't do that anymore. And then we got a phone call saying, Yeah, I love it, and he loved the experience well, on Cleave. So he did Hard Cold Fire. And um, we hope to get him in to do the next one. But it's really good because he, he knows us inside out as people. He knows what the band strengths are. And it makes things a lot better. So in the studio, if he doesn't like something, he's not tipping around the artist going, oh, I don't really like this direction. Yes. He can say straight out, lads, that's not working. And we'll respect it. Yeah. Similarly, if we feel really strongly about something, he'll take it on board too. Making music is meant to be a joyous thing. It's meant to be a cathartic thing. And he certainly adds to that experience. Early days. Andy Kearns wrote most of the material, and now it's much seems to be much more collaborative. It's all credited to all three of you yeah. guys. Is that because it comes out of jamming rather than you're sitting writing the songs, or what? What, what, what has changed? I think what what not what's changed the most is uh, file sharing, digital file sharing, mm -hmm. uh, things like. In the past, we would have got together and I would have had a boatload of ideas and I would have played them and then at the end of the session, nobody really, everyone thought, well, Andy, this is what Andy does. But because we've all got our own little home studio setups, we're, I'm getting stuff all the time from Magnum from Neil. So there's a song on the new album called Woe, which has got a great riff. Mm -hmm. And that was Neil. Neil sent me an email and said, I'm not a guitar player, but I've got a little synth. Could mm -hmm. you play this on the guitar? And he sent me the riff. Yeah, yeah. And I played it back through a Marshall amp and sent it back to him and said something like this went perfect. <laughs> so that was it. And something like Poundland of Hope and Glory yeah, yeah. was mostly written by Michael. Uh -huh. But it's the things like, you know, it's I'll be sent this and I'll go, this is too good not to use and then we'll collaborate a little bit on it and we'll add to it. But that's why, I mean, whenever we were just, for some reason, I think it's obviously those two lads can sit at home and listen to stuff they played back and the, the glare is not on you. Yeah, you know, yeah. like if you're in, if there's three of you in a room and you go over, get you got any riffs? All of a sudden, yeah, you're under yeah. pressure. Whereas someone can send you one and go, look, Tuesday night half past eight. Have we listened to this? If you don't like it, no bother. Yeah, yeah. And then I can listen to it perfectly rather than a bunch of feedback wheeling from me out. On this day, 28 years ago, I was in the field in Donington. Yeah. You were on the bill, second to Metallic. There's so the long story to that. They were thinking of putting us on the bill because yes. Lars was a fan. And the record company said, Lars Ulrich wants you to play it there, a show at Donington, but he's never met you. <laughs> so the record company said, Slash a snake that we're playing in Paris. Lars Ulrich's a guest. And Lars would like to meet you. So the record company flew me and Michael McKeegan over to Paris yeah. to meet Lars before the show. Uh -huh. And he, we had a beer with him. He got chatting and said, I really like you guys' music. Would you be up for doing it again? Then we got chatting about music, about Ireland. Yeah. 
And then we went home, and, and then the next, that was on, I think, Thursday night, and Monday morning, we got a call saying, yeah, you're on the bill. Um, but they also played a warm-up show in heaven in London, the yeah. club, before. We were invited down to that. We got to meet them and hang out with the rest of the band. So like, I obviously got to meet James Hetfield out of Metallica. is a bit of a hero of mine, because the way he plays guitar. Oh, I yeah, love his yeah. style. Got to meet him, got to meet Kurt. Kurt asked me where I bought my shoes. He was wearing these really bizarre black Teddy boy shoes, yeah, and, he, yeah. and he wanted to know what shop it was. I remember writing down the shop in London for him. The gig itself was, it was more, I enjoyed the Donington the year before in 94 yeah. because it was more of a, a festival. I think this was, even though it was Monsters of Rock, it was really a Metallica show because it'd been away yeah. for a while. So that was a bit more. Um, it was good. They, they treated us really, really well. Yeah. They took us out afterwards. They went to like a club in Birmingham and they, they, they gave us seats right beside them. They chatted to us, bought us drinks. They were lovely. I wouldn't hear a bad word said against Metallica. They're yeah. brilliant. But I think gig-wise, as punter-wise, ironically, I meet more people now that preferred that gig than the one we did in 94. People that said it was amazing. I was kind of going, oh, I wasn't sure. Maybe because we were higher up the bill, I was nervous. Maybe because it was Metallica's gig. I meet so many people now that were at that Metallica gig, they go, oh, that's a gig got me into it. Which, it's brilliant for me, because I remember at the time not being so convinced. I knew we played well, but I didn't know how much of an impression we made, but we obviously made some, so that's good. It was yeah. towards the end of the yeah. Fife tenure, yeah. so maybe it was bittersweet in a way, too. I mean, it was obvious at that point, the Fife lesson, that he didn't like touring. Mm -hmm. He never felt comfortable doing festivals. Yeah. He really, really didn't. And going on tour was torture to him. And and I just think, you know, we had so many gigs planned. And even whenever Graham Hopkins joined the band in 96, the first, whenever the first gigs we did were left over ones that were with the five in the band. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it was to kind of, it, I think it's just, it was for the best. It was it played out, not played out as nice as a happy end as it could have been, but it could have been a lot more bitter as well, which is yeah, yeah. good, yeah. I have to talk about Trouble Gum because next year, you you, you know what I'm going to say, yeah, yeah. 30 years next year. It's happening. And yeah. what's happening? <laughs> uh, we are doing, at the minute, there are 26 Trouble Gum shows across Europe. Yeah. There'll be some in the UK, there will be Irish Trouble Gum shows, uh, there will be ones in Scotland and Wales, and there'll be uh, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, Hungary, they'll, they'll be all over the place. The last time we did three in the UK and a handful in Germany, but this time around, because it's the 30th, we're really, at the minute there's 26 in counting. Actually, funny enough, because we've got the early part of the year quite flat, we're writing our next album. <laughs> we hope to have it written for the festival season so that we can enjoy the festivals and the Trouble Gum shows. Who owns it now? Universal? Universal, yeah, we've been in touch. I mean, they, they, to be fair to Universal, every time there's any kind of Trouble Gum milestone that they're in touch. Uh, and they're very good, the people that we have, that we talk to. We have to keep up with channels because it's, it's, you know, it's our best selling record on Universal and they've never let it go out of stock yeah. and it's sold across the world. So every time there's any kind of thing, they're straight under our management and vice versa. Because I'm imagining they're going to do a 30th anniversary issue. Is, is that in discussion? No, that, that's in discussion. There is, yeah. a, there is discussion, the 30th anniversary issue of the Colour Vine. We're, we're looking to see if there really are any unreleased tracks or any unreleased live tracks and we're looking at all MTV concerts and stuff. Yeah, so that's all being looked at now. We had a meeting about that, what's this now, August? We had a meeting about that early August uh -huh. with the band and management and that's on the table, yeah. What's it like then for you to be revisiting that? As a musician, I like it because you, I play a different way. Whenever I made that album, I was a different musician than I am yeah. now. I'm a far better guitar player for a start, but it was the naivety made me take risks that me as a more experienced guitarist wouldn't take now. So whenever I go back and listen to some songs, I'm going, oh my God, what was I doing with those two chords? <laughs> but it kind of, it sold hundreds of thousands of copies, so it's like it worked. So that's, I like going back to it. We did it before, but I think this time I'll be a bit more relaxed, if that's the right yeah. word. It won't, it won't be, it's going to be a genuine celebration. It's 30 years, man, this is a yeah. big thing. Uh, so what I'll normally do is I will go into my little man cave at yes. the start of the year and I'll put the album on in headphones I'll try and dig out the pedals and the guitars that I used oh, yes. and then some of them obviously are a bit ancient they'll need to change it but I'll um, I'll try and get it as close as possible to the record we want to do something with it live so rather than just the last couple of times we've done this it's been playing the record as it is in the record but we might visit some of the live shows from 94 yeah. and see what way we maybe changed it live then and maybe integrate some of that like we did little bits of uh, elongated sections in our version of Isolation and something yeah. like Unbeliever, we had a little spoken word singing bit at the start. Yeah, yeah. Um, trigger inside, sometimes a little longer in or with feedback. Yeah. So something, I might, bringing something like that might be quite interesting. Make it more, it's almost theatrical in a way. Yes, you know, it's yeah, not, yeah. But it's, grand, it's just something a bit different. Yeah.